Daylight gently falls through the window as my hands scrub the dishes. To feel such supreme peace at this simple task takes my mind to wander among the sunlit rays. For eternity is in my heart, and delight is the mundane. Dr. Philippe Nicholas is a fantastic Hegel scholar, and I've had the pleasure and delight of speaking with him on a number of occasions about the great genius that was Hegel. Dr. Nicholas is also a poet, and poetry is language at its most distilled, as Rita Dove put it. Poetry also is a form of literature that is like a river that runs alongside philosophy, distinct, but here and there the rivers can merge and become one, and you can't tell where one ends and the other begins, and then they separate again. Great philosophical poetry, and I would argue great poetry in general, general tends to occupy, tends to take place in, tends to float upon the waters where literature and philosophy meet. Now, this is very difficult because if literature comes to feel overly philosophical, it fails. In the same way that if philosophy feels overly literary or poetic, it fails. You have to strike a balance. It's like cooking. Um, the ingredients, not only do you have to have the right ingredients together, they have to be in the right proportion. They have to be distributed, cooked well, and you also have to know your audience. You know, if you cook meat for people who don't like meat, even if you do it perfectly, they won't like it. So there's a whole complicated stack, if you will, of variables and layers that have to be taken into consideration. It's quite a challenge, and Dr. Philippe Nicholas has managed to do it in this poetic work of brilliance for 121 pages. The, this is not blank verse either, and that's really extraordinary. I believe it was Robert Frost who said that blank verse, verse is like playing tennis with the nets down. It's an entirely different ballgame. And admittedly, any poetic attempts that I ever make tend to be blank verse because I can't imagine having every single line have a particular syllable, number, number of syllables, rhyme scheme. It's very difficult. I like villanelles, for example. I like sonnets. But it's a different ball game to like something and then to do it. And Dr. Philippe Nicholas has done it. Just listen to the language. The words crack and crumble. The lines racked and rumble. Grind, grand edifices and structures high are ideas that first mumble and then tumble, lifting up as they were lifted by others, as they fall and fall and fall and fall and fall. The great idea that threw itself into these signs and sickles, always leaves the cave with its tatters, is the name that lives throughout thought, lives through language, through acts, through mer mercy, and through giving. You can hear the mastery of language in those lines. I'll also say, for the philosophically inclined, you can hear the always leaves the cave with its tatters. Obviously, that's an allusion to Plato. But notice how the poem is not dependent on you knowing that that is allusion to Plato. The poem works just as well if you don't know it. And that's always the trick. You have to, when you're doing philosophical poetry or literature in general, find a way to point to, point to ideas, notions, great minds, without making it, without it feeling gripped. Like you've pulled the philosophy into the poem. And the, poet, and, the, and the work is full of very subtle allusions to poetic works, and I greatly appreciate that. I believe there are also some brilliant allusions to, say, Dante that you can find um, the, that bring it all together. Lovelessly, for prevalent circles of time that would nest fr the free, abounding youth to mine, I beheld the dreads icicles of my life over a frozen winter landscape sublime marching diligently to obey the fife, which steered with stern meter my argent being across the snowy plethora with great strife, where underneath unlived passions lay dreaming. In ignorance above, I sought their meaning. So for me, this combines together Canterbury Tales, 
you know, we're off on a quest, it's time to journey. But also Dante, which is at midlife's journey, one finds himself in a dark wood. But here we see, we find ourselves in the final circle of hell, which is frozen. Now it's not explicitly that, and it's not necessarily hell, but there's this bringing together of those different layers. And I love the assertion of the word sublime over a frozen winter landscape, sublime. The word sublime is well chosen because there's a way in which we can see winter as beautiful. But it also could be alluding, say, to Burke, where the sublime, in contrast to the beautiful, can be a force of destruction. And when one is early in life, it can be easy to follow the sublime and not follow the beautiful. But of course, life without sublimity could be problematic because it could lack, lack vigor. So how do we find the blend between vigor and structure. And in general, I think that is the bind of poetry, right? You don't want the poetry to too, be too bound to structure because then it can be rigid. But then if there's no structure, you can't understand it. And it's just nonsense. It's just playing with the tennis net down. And so you have to find the blend. And that's one of, I think, I do think at midlife that the reality of needing to find that blend becomes very, very important. There are also little moves in the structure. So, for example, in Ignorance Above, I sought their meaning. There's a lack of a period. Well, in your ignorance, you forget to do periods, but also the period is freedom from the structure, right? The next line will be capitalized and heartened by the irreverent pallid cold, waxed my ripped skin with the wane that turned it bold. Past misfortune solidified its embrace and within the wordless chamber. It would mold the citadel of solitude and debase any outside interaction into filth, washing it fearfully away in disgrace, in the anxious foreboding that changeth, splitteth, could assail and infest with ominous tilth. I mean, just hear the language. It just rolls off the tongue. I, I, I particularly enjoy reading this collection aloud just because you can hear the design so magnificently that brings it all together. I mentioned the missing period and here's a brilliant move. So he's going to be talking about kind of this balance between passion and structure and age and youth and sublimity and beauty and so on. And we'll say by pleasant security made delicious. <laughs> That's such a good line. By pleasant security made delicious scaffolding the callow dial. World, wild flirtation with maze upon maze, dazzle repetitions, repetitus, where moderation is its own starvation. And now you have a period. So is that period a starvation <laughs> because it's moderating the passion by reintroducing the period, which could starve the work, but now it becomes more structured as arguably needed for intelligibility. These are the great tensions which, with which we have to learn to live. I will also note the syllable count uh, say at the beginning of the work we have 11 syllables it will gradually climb into 14 and higher numbers which matches I think with the intensity of the movement if I were to guess uh, the struggle becomes more difficult but then we can have reductions in syllable as the language finds its place and the journey has to be quicker one has to move on quicker, quicker foot so the syllable count is well chosen um, I also like this part. Beyond compass lie thorn, prickly within these blades, greened, grounded, adorn, a ziggurat, sanctified, high, debonair, Christdale hunger, administered moonshine, porn, labyrinthine, unbound, spurious despair, as an ideal feast, beauty written for flesh, yet not touch and eat, disclosed evening prayer. There is, I have in this collection, many, many underlines. Your body teaches my soul to worship beauty. Each detail, a world unto itself, flowers sense. Hmm. And this, this part. What strains wanders, wool a gig throughout this one verse from dense colossal bursts does a cerebrum nurse who looks ever further back at its inception, that inflamed rocks the generalized conception, 
time traces itself backwards to eternity. One moment gifts another in maternity. Still yet nothing truly becomes without some loss. Sacrifice is the strength that carries love across. Dr. Nicholas is a fan of William Blake. And when I was younger, I remember reading all the uh, Norton Fry on Master Blake. It was a lot of Harold Bloom, a number of the literary criticisms. And Master Blake is an example of someone who finds that extraordinary blend between philosophy and style, structure and passion. And a number of the poets at that time, you know, Byron, Shelley, the greats, the romantics, you, f you see this extraordinary drive to write something that points to something beyond itself. But of course, believing in something beyond requires a mastery of language that is too sublime and beautiful and well constructed to feel as if it's arbitrary. You know, it's like the cathedrals in religion, right? Uh, Peter Kreeft mentioned this once on the idea, can you imagine being in a, a medieval town, mud huts, poverty, poor. And then there's this spaceship called a cathedral right in the middle of it. And you walk inside and it might be the only time in your entire life where you've heard music. And there it is. And the full body experience of the cathedral would make the idea that divine realities are not real Intenable. It would just simply be unbelievable. How could the structure exist and it be arbitrary? It would certainly feel like it was pointing to a world beyond itself. I don't think it's by chance that the loss of beauty, and really I would say the loss of poetry that seeks to point through mastery to something beyond itself, I don't think it's by chance that the loss of this has contributed to what Viveki calls the meaning crisis. And... I don't think it's by chance that we have a world where the majority of people don't think much of poetry, I'm afraid to say, that then the majority of people can suffer feelings of life being insignificant. Great works of poetry present to you a language that just forces you to acknowledge that if humans are capable of this language, there must be something more to them. They must contain worlds that are worth exploring, that can add color and life and truth, beauty, and goodness to the facticity around us. Uh, Dr. Nicholas accomplished that, accomplishes that in his work, a poem of change. And indeed, it can change how you carry yourself in the world. Great poetry always can. Great literature always can. Would time pass if humanity was not in the world there? It will, but like all slumber, passes fast like a prayer, searching for what is lodged in pure between, snare of its own enigma. God's prayer is that this dust fold from universal furnaces into unbidden tide. The idea that the dust of the earth, which comes from a big bang or some burning of the stars, some universal process that we don't fully understand, some universal furnace, would become an unbidden tide, an ocean, waves that hit on the shore and generate a music that summons us to look beyond and then pulls away as if it was never there. That's a beautiful articulation. And indeed, one can only hope, one can only pray to God, that the dust of the universe would fold in of itself into waters that could hit upon the shore and call beyond themselves. Is it a spiritual genetics at work? How do I go through this world without pursuing who haunts me the most? Scentless and clerical are my achievements and voices no longer hers, but my perversions, demonic angels leaping in glee in rows of a fumbling ship, waddling chair oars in tuneful repose. I love that idea of, is it a spiritual genetics at work, bringing the concrete and the spiritual together? And indeed, how do any of us go through this world if we're not haunted by something? It seems life is best when haunted. And it does feel like it's clerical in its achievements.
and like there are voices. The sacred romance that we are part of, to use Elridge's language. And it calls us, and that haunting is what leads us to write. That haunting, when literature loses it, is why literature dies. Please also note, it seems to me, the combinations of Milton, Pandemonium, the Castle, Dante, Beatrice, her, and maybe even Lovecraft with the boat and the ice, with the haunted mountain where they go to ice, ice uh, Antarctica, with the great ancient one. That's very experience can overwhelm us and kill us, and yet we are haunted and must pursue it. To me, I often feel like the choice we have to make today is belief and is if the thing that haunts us is a great ancient one from Lovecraft or if it might be a beatific vision. There is great risk to pursue. There is great risk to write poetry that would wake one up from their dogmatic slumber because what if they never sleep again? So there is a bravery that goes into writing poetry that seeks to point. I also like the imagery of a boat because a boat is going somewhere but you feel like you're not, you're traveling, but you're not, right? You're kind of stuck on it. It's like the angel of history that Walter Benjamin commentates on by Clee, pulled forward on this wire. One could even think that invisible wire dragged in the Quinton section of The Sound and the Fury. I always associate those together, where rationality seems very deterministic and pulls us forward, perhaps toward the ancient one of Lovecraft. And to escape that, we would need poetry or we'd need non-rationality. This would suggest, and I think this is true, that rationality with arts is doomed, basically, to be moved forward. And you hear about this in conversations about Gerard, how you're pulled by mimetic desire to some sort of future. It feels like you can't escape. And the imagery of the boat, I associate with that. What is pain that lingers not beyond its exit? For is not the privilege of life to debit the feeling of its destruction anterior expressed veinless in creation interior it is interesting how in life there are certain pains that you heal and you think you are thus free of them only to find that they linger beyond their exit and they gain life that pain gains life when it moves from the external to the internal but of course it is pain but there is something incredibly life-giving about internalizing that pain. And just this line, an atlas of infinite horizons, Mary, to once more to be a child to the world for the first of time's crack upon shoulders, broad who sung, universed, unversed, the cloud bursts blue, without a sky to save, the fault that finds itself wry in unalterable call, for is youth not an invention of the timeless, a crackerjack? convention, yet polite shrewdness, where what is adroit serves heteronomously, the singular blight that is autonomously. Stunning. Truly stunning. And just the language. His vocabulary is unbelievable. Is adulthood not rebellion temporal, the sublime fact that what ends goes on eternal via negation, negate metalaxical, the spear that opens and release its obstacle. Again, very subtle allusions to Hegel. I could just read so many lines out of this book. I highly suggest it. You must get it. You can find it on Amazon. How you need to pick it up. And you can find the link below. I believe this here is a return. It might be an allusion to the little Giddings of Four Quartet. Eliot says something along the lines of, and we return to the place of our beginnings and know it for the first time where the fire and rose are one and neither are consumed. Dr. Nicholas is going to do a play on that. I think he alludes to it, but it's, it's a slight play, a slight variation. The name of names has many names and even more words, yet is less than nothing without a voice. Alludes a bit there to some of the apathetic tradition, I think. To sing its plight as its own. How many times have I not retraced my steps only to discover what I have forgotten? Repetition of an inane difference. The circles I move in become so large, I know neither beginning nor end. This is my fear, my shadow. The harder I fight it, the stronger it grows, and I lapse back into pure passion. 
where the face is effaced and masks become my guide. Now here we start, I think, also bringing the entire work together. There's a denial of repetition, a denial that we retrace the same roads, which is precisely, ironically, which leads to a repetition, a problematic repetition, kind of an effacing repetition, as opposed to the sublating repetition, I think we see in Hegel, and I would also argue David Hume. <laughs> in the harder I fight it, the stronger it grows. The face is effaced and masks become my guide. So pure passion, pure passion is problematic, pure sublimity. But he has also made arguments where pure structure is problematic. And that, in my bias, <laughs> points to belonging again, the book we've done on the, the uh, tension between pure release and pure constraint, as Philip Reeve talks about, and I associate with Hannah Arden. So there is a tension in looking for pure passion and endless experience, because that's when you actually have a spiritual repetition and you don't go anywhere. You have to own repetition. You have to own, Thomas Wynne will talk about, the letting be, the making of a clearing, Heideggerian, to let be, to not escape the clearing, but to allow the clearing to be, which comes from a repetition that is aware of a repetition so that there might be a true negation of which there is a sublation where beings, lowercase b with an S, becomes being with a capital B, to allude to Thomas Wynne who I always appreciate speaking with. And so there is an understanding. So there is an understanding where a part of our quest today is not escaping where we are, but to live where we are. The meek have inherited the earth because meekness and surrender lifts us from our weary addictions and the endless trenches of violence and power. The earth, the sun, and the waters of life Give themselves up to those a thirst, but the good share to their enemies before fulfilling their own. Up until now, we have survived so as to live well. But now may be the time that we must live well if we want to survive. The view from the mountain is resplendent, and many have seen our land from above the skies. Perhaps a time may come when we must depart the soil and the green, but the seedful earth is ever the body of mind and of spirit. Why did this exuberance come about? When did such amazing creatures come to be? And I think that's an allusion to the tempest. The city of questions are the imminent creations. Let us bear witness to their epiphany. Along the spurious rain, I strode down the mountain and into the townships come upon the greenhouse of my neighbor and my friend. The door is open, waiting lovefully. Those paragraphs, those lines, those coming together, and it's beautiful to see the poem change in its form into paragraphs as it comes to the close, suggesting a fulfillment, a filling out, a fulfillment in the structure. <laughs> So that's visually given to us. And then when he returns to the journey, so the view has a paragraph structure, this coming together. And then when he walks in the journey, it goes back to verse, lines. So you see, it's all intentional, it's all designed. I think these parts are some of the be best encapsulations of what I associated with David Hume's philosophical journey. And I think also Hegel's making of the abstract into the concrete and the lived the becoming other, the identifying with other, as opposed to seeing ourselves above the other. Yes, there is something about going to the mountain that is very important and seeing the world from it. But we ultimately cannot live there and shouldn't live there, for that's where we miss out on the point. If philosophy goes to the mountain and lives without literature, I think it dies. If literature goes to the mountain without philosophy, I think it dies. One must have both. And this line... Up until now we have survived so as to live well, but now may be the time that we must live well if we want to survive. I just find that extraordinary, and I think it is true. This is arguably the meaning crisis. This is what Freud saw. If you had first world nations, then internal states, mental health, all these things would become a big deal, and you have to learn well. 
You have to live well to survive. You no longer can have your days filled with the acts of survival because you have technology. So everything now becomes learning how to live. And in learning how to live, it can be tempting to think that we just need infinite, we just infinite destruction, infinite experience, infinite sublimity, pure passion, where we don't embed ourselves in anything. But this is to run. Living well only happens here, now. And we must learn to live well if we want to survive. And reading a collection like this by Dr. Philippe Nicholas in of itself is an example of what one can do to learn how to live well so that we might survive. For more by Dr. Philippe Nicholas, please see his YouTube page, his website, check out his work on Hegel. Please buy this collection, Shada, which you can find on Amazon, A Poem of Change. And thank you, Dr. Nicholas, for writing it.